one of my earlier videos, I talked about chocolate doilies, applying chocolate lace flat on a plate to create a nice underliner for a dessert. Well, in this video, I'm gonna take that a notch higher and show you how to apply doilies or chocolate lace to a cake, like on this six inch cake that I've got in front of me. It's really essentially the same technique, except it involves a little more finesse in terms of chilling the chocolate and getting it onto the sides of the cake. Let's start first with what you need in terms of a cake and how you want your cake arranged before you start piping the lace. I've got a six inch cake, it's actually six and a quarter, um, up on the stand. If you do want to present your cake on a cake stand, as opposed to a plate, or, or whatever you want to present it on, the important thing is to get it on your presentation plate before you start, because once you get the lace on, it's really hard to move the cake without breaking the lace. So I've got my six inch cake up on this cake stand. I've anchored it to the stand with a little bit of buttercream, which is chilled in place. You can also use a dab of royal icing underneath it just so the cake it doesn't move around because you will be applying a little bit of pressure to it when you put the lace on it. The other thing I should point out is I'm up on a cake stand and you know it's inherently top heavy. So one thing I've done, I don't have a friend here in the kitchen today helping me out. If I did, I'd have them holding the bottom of the cake stand the whole time I'm working. I've actually got this white sticky material down here and this is a floral adhesive it's like a clay you can find other things that you know, to stick along the bottom of the cake stand but I like to anchor it in place with that so the stand doesn't move as I'm applying pressure to it too the other thing to look at this is a store-bought cake by the way so if you don't want to make the cake yourself and ice it perfectly smooth which is somewhat challenging you can get one and then just dress it up elegantly like this with a little half an hour or so and making the lace and you've got a really showy end product now this one I got from the local bakery. He did a really marvelous job of icing it, but for lace purposes, it needs to be about as straight as possible up and down along the sides because if there's any icing sticking out either at the bottom or at the top, the lace isn't gonna lie flat. So I'm noticing, and the camera might be picking it up here, a kind of a lip of icing overhanging here. And then on the right side, I'm looking at it from the sides of the cake, there's some icing sticking out on this side. So I'm just gonna clean it up a bit. I've got a bench scraper here, and this is a buttercream, so if I warm up the bench scraper, I'm gonna be able to basically melt off some of those lips on the icing pretty, pretty effectively. This is actually cooled down, so I'm gonna to need to, I may need to heat it up because I'm able to touch it here with no problem, but we'll see what I can do with it as warm as it is. I'm gonna start on the right side, and I'm just holding my bench scraper as perpendicular you know, flush with the surface of the cake as perpendicular to the cake plate as possible and scraping off the excess icing there. It's just a little bit, but even that little bit can make a difference. This is a, a, an Italian buttercream, I believe. It's made with 100% butter. So when it sits in the fridge, it, it hardens. The last thing I'm gonna do is take a small offset spatula and just knock down this upper edge. This won't interfere with the lace, but it may interfere with the icing border I'm gonna put on top of it later. So that's looking pretty good. The other thing I might do is just tidy up this icing here so that it doesn't interfere with getting the lace down later. And now I'm gonna set this aside and show you how to actually pipe the lace that's gonna go on this. A Couple of things we should note though before I set the cake aside are its dimensions iced because this is important to determining the template you're gonna to use to create the chocolate wrap. It's about six and a quarter across which means the length of my, my wrap needs to be at least six by pi, a little bit of engineering in here, six times 3.14159, plus I add an inch or two. So I want a piece of paper that's at least 22 to 23 inches to get around the circumference of the cake. And I'll show you this in a bit. And I'm also measuring the height of it. And it's just about four inches tall. So I'm gonna have guidelines that are gonna come up to the height of the cake as well, and a little bit higher just to clear the top of the cake. So now that we've established those dimensions, I'm gonna set it aside, swap out the table arrangement here, and prepare the template for the chocolate lace wrap. Okay, my cake's set aside. It's all ready to get the lace wrap on it, but we've gotta get this, this template for creating the lace wrap to the right dimensions. Before I measured the cake at about six and a quarter across diameter and about four inches tall, and with that diameter, I need about six, as I said, six by 3.14, plus a couple of inches for overlap um, to accommodate the circumference of the cake. Because once I pipe the chocolate, it's gonna get wrapped like so around the cake. 
So I've got a piece of parchment here. I've partially marked it out already. I'm going to try to replicate the pattern on the cake I showed you earlier. Again, as with the doilies, you can create any kind of pattern you want. It could be totally random. It can involve multiple colors. But we're going to do a fancy and relatively formalized lace wrap. So I do want some guide marks for myself. And this length, just to verify, is about 23 inches long, which is ample. I might have an inch or two overlap in the end, but I'd rather have a little more extra, you know, a little extra chocolate overlap to remove in the end, as opposed to coming up short at the back of the cake and then having a gap in lace there. So I always give myself a little bit more. This is a um, two level design. So if you recall the original cake, I had kind of a lattice work that went around the bottom and I've marked off about half of the height of the cake, about one and three quarters inches to do the lattice work at the bottom. And then in each of these triangular areas, which are about two and a quarter inch wide at the base, I'm gonna be putting a little swirly kind of pattern. And then we'll have a smaller swirly zigzag along the top. The total height of this um, up to the point of the, these little triangles is three and three quarters inches, which is about the height of the cake. But with the addition of this little zigzag at the top, I'm gonna just clear the top of the cake and I like to have a little extra chocolate at the top because I'm going to be piping a border almost immediately once the chocolate gets wrapped with buttercream with the icing on, of the cake. And that buttercream will attach to the chocolate and help hold that lace in place. So it's nice to have a little bit extra chocolate on top so that the buttercream can grab onto it and keep that lace from falling off when I unwrap the parchment paper. Okay, I haven't finished this guide, so I just wanted to give you an example of how I drew these triangles. They were two and two quarters inches two and a quarter rather, inches in width. So I've marked off um, two and a quarter inches here. I need to draw in this last triangle. And to, I just wanna mark the midpoint of the triangle, which is half of two and a quarter is at one and one eighth. And I'll mark it up to the three and three quarters inch height, and then just draw some guides there. And I'm doing this with pen. You can use a marker. Um, but as with the chocolate doilies we did before, you want to turn this around. Whoops, I went off guide here. You want to turn this over so that when you pipe on it, the chocolate doesn't pick up the pen markings. Not so obvious with the semi-sweet chocolate we're working with, but it'd be really obvious if you were working with white chocolate. Now you'll notice, hopefully, that the chocolate lace piping is going to end here, but I have extra parchment paper above it, about another quarter of an inch, because I'm going to have to pick this up once it's all piped and wrap it around the cake, and I don't want to be putting my fingers in the chocolate, so I always add a little extra at the top for handling room. So my guide's all done. I'm going to flip it over, as I said, and with a pen, I can see enough through to be able to pipe, no problem. The other thing you'll notice is I'm piping on the back of a large sheet tray. Why is that? That's because once this is piped, it needs to set up partially, just enough so that it's not fluid, but so that the chocolate is still flexible. And that means I need to slide this big strip into my, <laughs> into my refrigerator to do that. So before you start, you want to clear out a zone in your refrigerator that will allow you to do that. I've got a standard size refrigerator, and if I clear out the bottom shelf, I can get this into the bottom of it, kind of on the dia diagonal. So I will be picking up the whole sheet tray so I don't have to have floppy chocolate on a piece of parchment paper flipping around as I walk across my kitchen. I'm gonna bring, be bringing this over to my refrigerator and then sticking it all in there. So it's good if you have to a long walking distance to your, your fridge, as I do, to make sure you're on something that you can carry the chocolate on. Because this will be floppy when the chocolate's wet and then your pattern will get all yicky looking. Okay, so that's a little bit of instruction on the setup you need. The only other things you need to pipe the chocolate lace are a parchment cone. You can use a pastry bag and a tip if you like, but I love cones because I get the ultimate control. I'm gonna cut a very, very small tip in here. Melted chocolate is very fluid, so I don't need a large opening to get a, a, a width of chocolate like I have on that lace, which is rather delicate. I'll probably have this cut less than an eighth of an inch. And I've got melted chocolate. I've melted it in a double boiler, just like I did for the doilies. And I'm, I'm cooling it down a little bit so it's not warm. It's just like lukewarm to the touch. I have not tempered the chocolate. Again, that's a process of taking the chocolate through various temperature stages, up and down, so that when it sets up, it sets up really fast. That if I do temper the chocolate, this will not really work effectively. Tempered chocolate sets up much faster than chocolate that's just melted. So if your room is cool, in the course of piping this lace, if you've tempered the chocolate, it could set up on you. And then you'll have difficulty wrapping it around the cake. So I prefer, in this scenario, most definitely just to work with melted chocolate. It won't set up quite as quickly and it gives you much more flexibility in terms of the time it takes to pipe this out before it sets up. 
So I've got my melted chocolate. I'm going to stick it in the parchment cone. I always hold my parchment cones by the notch as I'm filling them with anything, be it chocolate or royal icing, because if you don't, they can unravel on you and create a mess. And I usually never fill these more than about half to two thirds full just because I don't want to create any backflow issues out of the top of the cone. So I think that's enough for the purposes of this. And we're going to test the icing flow on the sheet tray first. And it's a little delicate for what I'm doing. Again, the glasses need to go on for these tasks. It's a little delicate. I want that. I want a line that's at least an eighth of an inch thick, and that's looking pretty good. I may have to open this up as I work because unlike royal icing, the chocolate consistency is going to change as I work with it. As it cools down, it's going to get thicker and clunkier, and I may need to open up the tip as I, as I work with it. But for now, it's still pretty warm. I'm going to actually slide everything down and start by piping the left section of this lace and then move my body down as I pipe. It's important to be kind of in front of the portion that you're piping. And I might even move a little bit forward because if you, if you aren't, the whole design can kind of lean as your body leans. So I've got a good flow. And I'm going to start by marking out, and I, I'm just going to do this half or a third of the, third of the, third of the pattern. So the camera can catch it. And then I'll continue. Piping this whole piece might take me about 20 minutes to half an hour because it's very detailed. If I were doing a random pattern, it could take two seconds. But I'm going to be a little bit precise with it. If you don't want to be this precise, you don't need to be. And again, I'm steadying the tip with my forefinger. The chocolate's pretty warm and fluid, so it's coming out pretty fast. And, I, and, and it's spreading as it hits the parchment, so I'm not, I don't feel I need to open it up, the tip up much. I might have to open it up as it cools. My hand's a little waving, wavery here. So I'm just going to mark a straight line across the top here. I'm just tracing over the guide marks I had before. If it's not perfect, um, that's okay, because... A lot will be disguised once it gets up. I do think I want a slightly heavier line. Just because if the chocolate's too fragile, it's more prone to breaking once you pull the parchment off. Okay, I'm going to do the loop-de-loop -loop parts first, starting at the end. One big loop in the center, and this is exactly what I did on my doilies, more or less, if you saw that video. Loop in the middle, going up to the top, and oh, I think I'm fitting three loops to either side. You'll notice I sometimes wipe off the tip as I'm working, and that's to get any extra tag of chocolate off so I don't end up with a, an extra big mass of chocolate in any area when I start piping again. Just cleaning that tip off a little bit gives a cleaner start to the next line. And as with the doilies, all the pieces here, if you're doing any kind of lace wrap on a cake, this pattern or any other, all the chocolate needs to intersect and connect because any parts that are freestanding or free hanging will pop off the cake when you release the parchment paper from the chocolate. And that would not be a good thing. It kind of defeats the purpose of doing this in the first place. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to basically repeat this pattern but do it upside down in the triangles that are at the upper part of the template. I'm trying to connect loops on either side where I can. So, so for instance, this one I'm connecting with that one, that one I'm connecting there, and this one I'm kind of connecting at the very top. That way it looks a little more symmetrical, especially when it gets up on the cake. Oops, it started the wrong, wrong end. I'm going to fit an extra loop in here. It looks a little empty. Might do the same here. Now, where there are big blobs of chocolate, they're going to appear as big blobs when I remove the parchment later. But I'm going to put some white dots there, kind of like I did on my doilies and what you saw on the 
finished cake just to break up those areas. I made a little bit of a mistake here. My line broke. So I'm going to go back in and try to correct it. I don't want to push too much at the beginning or the start or I'll have a big blob in the middle of that loop. And I think I corrected that pretty well. Oh, I forgot. I need to do a little zigzag at the top. And this is going to give me that bit of overhang that the icing will grab onto and which helps keep the cake in place. So this is going to extend. This part I'm piping now is going to extend slightly above the top of the cake. Okay, and then I'm going to start the grid along the bottom. If you make a mistake, it's a little harder to correct than on the doily. So the doily is a good beginning place to start with chocolate piping because it's easier to correct. I just drew a guide mark at the bottom. I'm going to put a little zigzag at the bottom here too over that guide mark. Oh, one note on the cake stand that you choose. I don't know that I mentioned this before, but it's important to choose one that doesn't have a lip because you're going to be wrapping that this big piece of paper around it. And if there's a lip, it's hard to get that the bottom of the chocolate wrap to align with the bottom of the cake. And I think you'll see that as we go about wrapping. Okay. And then for this, the grid pattern at the bottom, I'm just going to do parallel lines. I eyeball these, but if you're not comfortable with that, you can draw this out on your template and just trace over them. I'm spacing mine a little bit more than about three eighths of an inch apart, I would say. And trying to be as straight as possible. And as you're doing this part, it's especially important um, to move your body along the length of the wrap. I'm just doing this end. When we break, I'm going to shift my seat and move down so that I'm directly over what it is I'm piping because if I'm not, then things start getting piped at different angles as I move down, down the wrap. And I'm trying to be as parallel as possible here. And then I'll come back in the other direction into that blob starting at one blob and ending at another because those blobs I can dress up with dots later once I take the chocolate wrap off the cake. We'll continue this line and then I'm just once I'm done piping these lines I'm going to come back in and do little dots of chocolate in the grid to kind of reinforce this grid a little bit because it is a little bit delicate. And you'll see that I did that on the sample cake shown earlier. I also did it on the center of those doilies in my other video. Okay, and what I mean by that is I'm just gonna put a little dot of chocolate in each corner. And this, I just feel like it might be, it might be kind of folklore, Julie Usher folklore, but I feel like it reinforces this chocolate structure a little bit better. And it adds a design element that's kind of nice. You could put the dots down in different patterns to create a different pattern in this grid, but um, putting them all on one side is kind of a safe thing to do, particularly if your grid isn't perfectly symmetric because then it's less obvious that it's not. And you'll see my chocolate is still very fluid. Uh, note that it's very shiny. So if I were to lift this up now and wrap it on the cake, it would just smear on the cake and you'd get a yucky looking, all this pattern you pipe would be a mess which is why it's important once I'm done piping to partially set this up so that I don't smear the pattern when I put this lace on the cake. A little bit of a mistake there. A little trail of chocolate, which I can get out later once the chocolate's set up and on the cake, if it doesn't fall out on its own. Okay, so I'm, I'm about halfway through the wrap. What I'm going to do is finish this off. We'll take a little break while I finish this off and I'll come back and show you how we go about setting it up and getting it on the cake. Okay, I'm back. My chocolate lace wrap has been partially set up, so it's not runny, but still pliable. And that's important. If it's fully set up, it's going to crack on you when you wrap it around the cake. First step is to anchor the backside the cake and I'm just going to press it in here. I'm not going to touch the rest of the wrap because there's the possibility of it smearing. And I'm just going to carefully guide it around the cake, making sure that I'm 
staying flush with the bottom of the cake stand and then I'm going to press one more time where it makes contact with the paper where it overlaps where it begins to overlap the end of the other paper but I'm not going to press all that into the paper because it'll be harder to get off later so it's basically wrapped as I was wrapping that I got a warm in here and so you notice my parchment paper was maybe flopping around a little bit more if it's a little bit ch more chilled up you're going to have less play in the paper and it's going to be easier to wrap but I got an excellent wrap on that um, the next step before I put it back in the fridge to fully set up that chocolate is I like to anchor that little overhang of chocolate as I mentioned with a little bit of buttercream that'll just ensure that when I do eventually pull the parchment paper off that I don't take the whole wrap with it so I've just got a little buttercream same thing in here that I used to ice the cake and I'm just going to do a little border around the edge um, attempting to hit the chocolate as I do that now I've got this anchored with some floral clay on the bottom that's important to do when you wrap the cake because you don't want to knock the whole cake stand over but I do need to rotate my cake a bit in order to get this border down and looking good so I'm taking the clay off so that I can do that now and this is just a trailing shell border you can do any which border here the whole point of it is just to make sure you're connecting to that chocolate overhang if you can my overhangs a little low on this end but it's a little bit higher on the other end because the cake top was a little bit slopey the fact that this seam is flopping is okay I've got it nicely solidly sealed here and when the chocolate sets up we'll remove all of that excess I had about two inches excess I could have cut a slightly shorter template but again I'd rather have more than find once I've piped all that which took me about a half an hour that I didn't have enough you know enough chocolate to make it around the cake that would not be fun that's happened to me before but I've learned okay, I'm almost done with this border and then once I'm done the whole thing with the parchment still on it goes back in the fridge until the chocolates thoroughly set up to the point that I can peel that parchment paper off and that shouldn't take more than oh I don't know five ten minutes it depends how how chilly your fridge is the partial setting up of the lace wrap before I wrapped it was literally a minute in the fridge it's it's very very quick so there you have it my borders on top I'm going to fix this little piece here that's kind of sticking up and my chocolate lace wrap is nice and intact and level all the way around the bottom of the kickstand we'll set it in the fridge we'll unwrap it we'll apply a border at the bottom and maybe some white detailing uh, along these larger spots of dark chocolate and then we'll be done back soon The cake has been chilled to the point that you'll notice in areas the parchment paper is actually kind of separating from the chocolate itself, which is a good indication that the chocolate is firm enough for me to actually carefully and gently pull away the parchment paper. If there's any resistance at all to pulling off the paper, then chances are the chocolate isn't fully set up. So you don't want to pull prematurely or you can pull all of the chocolate off and I'm being very gentle here I've got a lot of extra paper here and it's kind of getting in my way so at this point I'm going to cut this off and now I'm coming around to the back side of the cake and at this juncture it's pretty important to not just pull the paper off because you'll take this piece with it that overlaps and it'll pull off the other side of the cake so what I do at this point is I take a hot paring knife and I score along the seam this is right where the paper and chocolate intersect and if the knife is hot enough it should just melt that chocolate along the seam you want to do this all the way from top to bottom my knife could be a touch hotter but it, it's cutting it and then what that allows you to do is lift off this outer piece of chocolate off this paper hopefully I'm going to get all that off the kickstand because if you don't remove that chocolate as you lift the paper off it again it'll break it'll break the lace underneath it and that's not great this is the back of the cake though there is a seam with this particular design there's really no way to avoid it with these wraps so if you do break a little off here it's not the end of the world ideally I want to clear all of this chocolate off the paper so I don't break any of the lace underneath so I'm just scraping it off I think I've got enough off. I want to get some of this off too. And then we'll go ahead and remove 
the rest of the parchment paper. And be careful here. I'm feeling a little more resistance, so I know my chocolate's getting a little softer underneath, so I want to be careful with how I pull. There you go. So I've got a nice, actually a nice clean seam there. Sometimes if I do pull off chocolate, I'll come in with some extra melted chocolate and just fill in the seam a little bit. This also helps to secure the lace in place. Um, it's more important if this were a tier of a wedding cake, for instance, and now we're going to lift this later and put this on something. I don't want the whole sheath of lace to fall off. So I'll sometimes put a little reinforcing bit of chocolate there. Okay, the next step is maybe to clear away some of this chocolate that's on my board. And I'm going to put a, a bottom border on this cake just to clean up that lower edge. And then we're going to decorate it with, well, actually, let me do the dots first. I've got some white chocolate in this, in this parchment cone. And I'm, I want to put some dots where they're those big blobs of dark chocolate just to break them up a little bit. And for this um, task, it's nice to be at eye level with your cake. So you're making perfectly round dots. I'm a little high. I prefer to elevate this cake. So we'll see how it goes. And I'm going to put my glasses on for this. Um, it's best to have your white chocolate, you know, as warm as it can be before it gets clumpy and seizes because when it hits this cold cake, it tends to set up fast and leave little peaks like on that particular dot. I'll probably do dots. I'll, I'll just do a few dots to give you an example of what I might do. And then we'll go ahead and finish out the bottom border. So you can just imagine that I would typically do this all the way around, around the cake, closer to eye level. In fact, I'm going to get off my stool and get closer to eye level, I think, the pipe. <laughs> How's this? Because I really do need to see what I'm doing. Just doing little trios of dots here to fill up that area. And there's a little bit of, my chocolate's a little bit cool. I, ideally, I'd sit this, maybe wave this over a burner and just heat up the tip of the cone to melt the chocolate a little bit more so I'm not getting those little tags. Now that one has a really long tag on it and to correct that, again, I take my trussing needle, carefully wipe off the chocolate, white chocolate, and try again. Still not great. Maybe I can just lift that tag off of it. There we go. Looks a little bit better. Yep, this is an indication that my white chocolate is probably um, too cold. So I'm going to break, warm it up, and then come back and try to finish off these dots and do the bottom border. Okay, I was having a little difficulty with my white chocolate. It was a little too cool. So as I was creating these dots and it was engaging with the cool chocolate on the cake, I was getting a lot of peaks, which I don't like, and I'm rather fussy. So I heated my chocolate up ever so slightly. You can overheat white chocolate very easily and it gets very clumpy, so watch out for that. I did it on a double boiler and I came back in and I re-piped all these dots. Um, ones I didn't like, I flicked off with my trussing needle and I think you'll see that they're more nicely rounded now and I'm much happier. So now we're gonna proceed with finishing off the cake. We've done all the basic elements of the chocolate wrap. Important things to remember are, you know, draw your template out in advance, make sure it fits around the cake. Do not temper the chocolate because then it will set up too quickly and you won't be able to wrap it around the cake. And then set it up just partially. The chocolate should still be pliable, but not brittle and break, yet it shouldn't be runny because you'll have a little challenge getting it up on the cake. In fact, with this one, the chocolate did get a little runny on me and you'll, you may have noticed my parchment paper started flopping around a little bit more could have been a little more set up. I ended up getting a pretty great result because I've done this a lot, but those are the kind of the three watch outs with the chocolate lace. And now just to finish off the border, I'm using the same buttercream I did on the top. You don't need a border at the bottom, but I like it. The chocolate edge at the bottom isn't particularly even. And it also helps to anchor the chocolate lace in place. So this is just a shell border or trailing star border, whatever you want to call it. You could do something else. I'm just going to pipe this all the way around. With this on a cake stand, I have to rotate the cake stand, of course. If you had this on a turntable, you could just rotate the turntable. And then we're going to do the top like I have on, the, on my demo cake sitting up on the counter there with some chocolate ribbons that I talk about how to make in another video. So check out the video on 
making ribbons with chocolate dough to see how that's done. Uh, this cake is pretty elaborate with just the lace on it, so it doesn't really need a lot on top. So I'm just going to finish it with a couple flowers and a couple little chocolate, pre-made chocolate ribbons and call it a day. This also looks really pretty with just some fruit on top, a few berries, just because the side is so elaborate. So yeah, this is a, a way to kind of dress up a store-bought cake if you don't want to add a lot of extra icing to the sides, but you want that nice rich chocolate element. Just pipe some chocolate lace and if you don't want to do a really fussy pattern like this that took me only a half an hour to do but if you want to spend even less time on it then just do a random squiggly pattern and that can look kind of cool and modern just make sure all the pieces of the chocolate interconnect that's another key thing to remember so there i've got my nice border down and then to finish it off i'm going to take these chocolate ribbons that i mentioned earlier these i pre-shaped maybe about an hour ago um, just to allow them to get a little firmer so that when I apply them to the cake they don't get all smushy. And I like to put a little blob of more icing in the middle just to kind of give them a little bit of height sometimes, not always, and to anchor them. We'll cover that all with flowers. I typically, when I decorate cakes, like to stand up and get a view from afar as it would be viewed if you were coming in to a room and seeing that cake for the first time. So sitting down isn't my chosen method for decorating cake tops, but just to keep me from bouncing all over here on camera, I will stay seated. And I'm kind of trying to look at it from the side here. I'm gonna give it a little more height by lifting that bow. This is my front of the cake because my seam's on the back side. So I am kind of decorating this in one direction for the most part but that seam isn't so noticeable, particularly because I, I did a nice clean cut on the back side. I think this just needs a couple of flowers. I'm using pesticide free organic flowers. These are roses, which are also edible. If you wanted to sugar these, that makes a pretty garnish too. I think that's looking pretty good. Maybe I'll put a teeny little bud there and some greenery and then we'll be good to go. And again, the, the, the methods for decorating the top are limitless. And there you have it. Front view, front view, chocolate lace. If you're intimidated by the lace up on the sides of the cake, start with the chocolate doily video, which you'll find elsewhere on my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me and live sweetly.